Hello, everyone. Welcome to the NASA Night Sky Network member webinar. We are hosting tonight's webinar from the offices of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California. I'm very excited to present this teleconference with our guest speaker. And tonight there's a, a lot of extra competition for uh, our attention with some other things going on elsewhere in the world. And so thank you very much for, for joining us. So our guest speaker tonight is Ed Bashore from the University of Arizona. Ed is going to be sharing with us the plans for NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission to an asteroid launching this coming September. We have a few announcements before uh, we go to Ed. We are working to make sure every club's contact information is up to date. For all of you club coordinators that are out there, please go to your club's page on the Night Sky Network website and check for outdated content, contact information and make sure that what is there is current. This will help potential visitors and new members find you and your club. Please make sure you check your club's email contact, public address, shipping address, and website information to make sure that it's accurate and current. There are a number of clubs we haven't heard from recently, and we would like to confirm whether or not they're still active. We also have congratulations uh, to the new prize winners. And so 10 clubs have won some Mars exploration posters in our quarterly event drawing. Through logging their events between April 1 and June 30, these clubs qualified themselves to enter the drawing for the posters. David, what do the posters look like? They look like this right here, as you can see in my little box there. They're awesome, they're on vinyl, and they're rather large. They're pretty much like mini banner size. So yeah, we got 10 lucky clubs that got these. So congrats, folks. They got this like the whole retro exploration tourism sort of feel that's been popular lately. And the clubs who, who won, who were drawn from uh, the drawing this last quarter, are the Astronomers of Verde Valley in Sedona, Arizona the Denver Astronomical Society in Denver, Colorado, the Keene Amateur Astronomy Club in West Dummerston, Vermont, the Low Country Stargazers in Charleston, South Carolina, the Pontchartrain Astro Astronomy Society in New Orleans, Louisiana, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit in Santa Barbara, California, the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project headquartered in, in Columbia, South Carolina, the Wabash Valley Astronomical Society in Brookston, Indiana, and the Warren Astronomical Society of Detroit, Michigan. Congratulations to all. Be on the lookout in your mail or in UPS deliveries for your posters. We also want to remind everyone that clubs who log at least two outreach events each quarter are qualified to receive toolkits and to enter the drawing. Uh, if you have not received a toolkit in a while and your club has been logging events, you may have already received all of the toolkits. If so, please contact us at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org to request an additional toolkit if needed or to see if we have any other materials we can ship to your club. Also, stand by at the end of the question and answer period for another giveaway of ASP's Total Skywatchers Manual. See, one of the things you may have noticed is that we have both a chat window and a Q&A window. The chat window is for folks to introduce themselves in general chat, along with any technical issues you may have during the webinar. The Q&A window is where you should submit questions for our guest speaker. It helps keep track of your questions so that we'll know whether or not we've answered your questions or not. If you do have any problems during the webinar, please, send, please let us know through the group chat or send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. So enough with the preliminaries. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Ed Bashore is the Deputy Principal Investigator of the OSIRIS-REx mission at the University of Arizona. Before he joined the OSIRIS-REx mission, he was Principal Investigator of the Catalina Sky Survey, a leading discoverer of near-Earth objects. Bashore's professional interests are software systems for scientific analysis and instrument control. Outside of work, Ed enjoys hiking, geology, and being an amateur astronomer. Someday, he hopes to find time to dust the cobwebs off of his 14-inch Celestron and resume photometry of cataclysmic variable stars. Please welcome Ed Bashore. Thanks very much, Brian. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep, I can hear you just fine. 
Excellent. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see if we're, sh are we sharing? Let's see. There we go. How's that? Looks great. Excellent. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get going. I want to talk to everybody uh, tonight about the OSIRIS-REx mission. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk to fellow amateur astronomers and to tell folks about our mission, which launches on September 8th, uh, which is just 48 days away. Uh, so we're all getting very excited here at the University of Arizona. Um, what I'd like to uh, talk about is uh, uh, OSIRIS-REx as a, as a really uh, a mission that's turning a, a, an important corner in our exploration of the, of the solar system. Uh, our mission is one that's going to return a sample uh, from a primitive asteroid called Bennu. And our mission uh, is a New Horizons mission, so it's in the same family as uh, the Juno mission, which recently went into orbit around Jupiter, and uh, the uh, New Horizons mission, which explored Pluto just a little bit over a year ago. Uh, so we're in very good company. Um, um, our mission is a PI-led mission. Uh, our principal investigator is Dante Loretta. He's my boss, and yeah, we, we all work here at the University of Arizona. Our job is to ensure that the scientific integrity of the mission is maintained and to do a lot of the science processing uh, for this mission during our proximity ops uh, when we get to Bennu in 2018. So uh, what I'd like to be able to do is talk to you a little bit about some of the objectives of our mission, what we're really trying to accomplish with OSIRIS-REx. Uh, we um, uh, will talk a little bit about uh, our object Bennu and how we came to choose it and why it's important, why we think it's the right object for us to be visiting with our mission. Uh, I'll uh, discuss some of the instruments that we have on board and what we are intending to do with those instruments. And then I'll show you a mission timeline, which is really designed to give you an idea of what our proximity operations around Bennu are going to be like. And I think uh, once you see some of the things that we're going to try when we get to uh, our thousand days around this asteroid, uh, you'll be pretty amazed at some of the uh, uh, outrageous kinds of trajectories that will fly in order to look for that important sample site where we'll retrieve a sample uh, and return it to the Earth in 2023. So probably the most important objective of our mission, uh, it's one of five key scientific objectives, is to return and analyze a sample of a pristine carbonaceous asteroid uh, and get the regolith, what we, it's, it's effectively broken soil, in amount uh, sufficient to study the nature, history, and distribution of these minerals that are on the asteroid. Uh, now in the picture I'm showing, it's not an asteroid at all. What we're looking at here, I think, is a really remarkable image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of NGC 3603. And what you really have in one single image, uh, in fact, when I saw this the first time, I thought it was doctored, but it's not. It's a single image that captures all of the um, stellar evolution, uh, the entire range of stellar, stellar evolution from birth to death and rebirth in one image. Uh, what you see at the center of the picture is a cluster of very bright, hot stars. Uh, they're massive, so they're burning up their fuel rev uh, pretty quickly, and they're evolving rapidly. Uh, just about uh, 10 o'clock off the center of the image is a star that's already starting to blow off some of its uh, 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 surface material as it becomes unstable and pushing it into the interstellar medium. Uh, we see other uh, examples of the interstellar medium to the right-hand side of the image uh, illuminated by the stars and, and also new stars forming in the, in the regions, in these gaseous and dusty regions in the, in the nebula. Uh, probably most important is uh, around 6 o'clock or just slightly to the left of 6 o'clock, we see uh, 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 several examples of something we call propylids. Uh, and those are really nascent stellar systems that are forming uh, with, planet, with potential uh, planetary systems forming around them as well. Uh, this sort of thing happened in our own solar system about four and a half billion years ago. And we would really like to get a sample of the chemistry of this environment uh, when, uh, when this was going on. And here's a slightly zoomed in image of one of these propylids. And, and by now, we've actually imaged lots of these things, uh, not only in visible light and infrared, but uh, in radio waves as well. And we're starting to see, uh, get a lot more information about these forming solar systems. This is really what we'd like to have a sample of, um, if, uh, if we could, of our own solar system. The question is, is 
where might one go in order to get that sample today? Uh, certainly, we could go out in front of my offices here in Tucson, Arizona, and try to pick up a rock and analyze that. But that rock has been through the, the subsurface of the Earth. It's been uh, moved around by um, uh, plate tectonics. It's probably been through a few volcanoes. It's been subject to exposure with water and oxygen, which are very reactive substances. In short, uh, the material we find here on Earth doesn't resemble anything like what we would expect to find on the surface of a primitive asteroid or in the early solar system. So where we have to go is we have to, we have to look for some of, the, some of the detritus that's left over from the formation of, of our solar system, and we think uh, the asteroids are a good place to do that. In particular, as we look through our inventory of asteroids that we have our, here on Earth, we call them meteorites, uh, we've found a small subset of those objects, those, those, that material, that's very carbonaceous, high in carbon. Uh, that's very important to try to understand the origin of organic materials that might have given, um, uh, given rise to life here on the Earth. Uh, and uh, we think that finding a carbonaceous asteroid is really where we would like to go. Uh, in addition, one of the big questions that we want to try to answer with our mission is where did the water come from on Earth? Even though water is a commonplace material here on Earth, uh, we really take it for granted. Uh, we really don't have a good answer yet for where the water came from. And if we can't find water in the, in the sample that we returned from Bennu, uh, perhaps that means that that water wasn't present uh, in the early solar system and that maybe it had to get delivered to the Earth in some other fashion. So these are the kinds of questions that we think delivering the material from a primitive asteroid might, uh, might uh, answer. Uh, again, I'd mentioned before that I think we're returning a corner with the OSIRIS-REx mission uh, because uh, this is the first time that the United States has returned a sample from an extraterrestrial object since the end of the lunar missions uh, over 40 years ago. Now, uh, to be fair, we have returned material from a comet uh, with the Stardust mission, and we have returned solar wind material from the Genesis mission. But with the OSIRIS-REx mission, we in turn intend to uh, return a fairly large sample. Our mission goal is to return at least 60 grams, but uh, we think we can actually do much better than that. So uh, this, is, uh, this is really something very important. And bringing that material back to Earth is key because we can study that material using techniques that are very sophisticated that we could never miniaturize and put on a spacecraft. And furthermore, we'll be able to study that material using techniques that haven't even been invented yet. I know people who are working on the lunar samples today who weren't born when the samples were brought back to Earth in 1970, and they're using techniques on those samples that weren't even dreamt of back then. And that's the kind of legacy we really want to leave uh, to uh, the scientific community uh, with the OSIRIS-REx mission. But aside from returning a sample, we also want to study something else. Uh, we want to study the Yarkovsky effect, and I'll see if I can start a little um, um, uh, movie here. Uh, it's a little jerky, but perhaps it will show the effect. Uh, the Yarkovsky effect is really the, the effect that causes uh, asteroids to change their orbits and become near-Earth asteroids. So we really have to ask ourselves, uh, if we're looking for near-Earth objects, which is something I did for a long time in the Catalina Sky Survey, uh, how do these objects actually find their way into the inner solar system? And uh, because the lifetime of these objects is not very long, about 10 million years or so, and they eventually run into a planet, fall into the sun, or get ejected from the solar system entirely. So something has to be responsible for replenishing the supply of near-Earth objects into the solar system, and we believe it's something called the Yarkovsky effect. And what that really is is the selective heating of asteroids as they rotate uh, as they orbit the, uh, the sun, and that selective heating uh, actually is re-radiated, and that re-radiated thermal radiation uh, actually acts as a little rocket thrust, which can change the, um, uh, the, uh, the motion of the, of the asteroid and the orbit of the asteroid. Depending on the, uh, the rotation, or depending on the direction that it rotates, it can actually cause an asteroid to move further out into the solar system, or it can cause an asteroid to move further in. And the Yarkovsky effect is not solely important for making this happen, making near-Earth uh, near objects happen. But what it can do is move asteroids into resonance zones with the giant planets, where the gravity of those planets, in combination with uh, resonance in their orbital periods, 
can actually throw asteroids into the inner solar system. It's extremely important to know more about the Yarkovsky effect because it could give us information about how we can better predict the orbits of near-Earth objects in the future. And that's really the key to uh, success in finding near-Earth objects, is to find them as early as you can, to predict their orbits as accurately as you can, so that if you do find one that does represent a threat to the Earth, you have plenty of time to study it and then ultimately mitigate the collision. So finding this, uh, or rather establishing a, a better understanding of the Yarkovsky effect around Bennu will be very important. And as it turns out, Bennu is one of the most dangerous objects we know about, with about a 1 in 2400 chance of hitting the Earth in the late in the 22nd century. So that adds even a little bit more importance to trying to understand the orbit of our target asteroid. So we also have a few other objectives, and I won't spend as much time on these as I did the others. But uh, uh, we do have a very large uh, uh, inventory, a large uh, library of information about asteroids here on the Earth taken from ground-based telescopes. And what we would really like to do as we approach our object, Bennu, is to compare our observations of the asteroid as we approach it and as we get directly around it, as we start to orbit it, with the observations that we obtain from the Earth. And we believe that it's possible that we might be able to extrapolate some of the interpretation of how global observations from the Earth uh, compare to observations taken in situ, you might be able to understand more about the existing observations that we have of other asteroids taken here from the Earth using ground-based and space-based telescopes. Uh, of course, we want to map the global properties and chemistry of the entire asteroid, uh, not only for the in intrinsic scientific value that that represents, but also as a way of surveying the asteroid to try to find a, an ideal sample site. Ideally, what we're looking for, first of all, is a, sa a site that's safe. We want to make sure that we don't endanger the mission by going to a site that's got a lot of rocks or that uh, represents some sort of a hazard to the spacecraft. We also want to make sure that there's sampleable material uh, on, on Bennu where we choose to, to sample our site, and so we'll be surveying for that. And then if we're lucky enough to have more than one site that's scientifically interesting, we'd like to be able to select the one that is most scientifically interesting. And that, what that really requires is a comprehensive mapping program of the entire asteroid. And then finally, once we select a sample site, we want to make sure that we carefully document the morphology, the chemistry, and spectral properties of the sampling site at very fine scales. And that's something that we'll do in a series of very close reconnaissance passes over our site before we attempt our sample. So let's talk a little bit about why we chose the asteroid that we chose. Um, when uh, the mission was conceived, um, we had about 500,000 asteroids in our inventory of, of uh, asteroids that had been discovered, mostly by the near-Earth object surveys. Uh, but uh, only a small fraction of those asteroids are, um, are accessible to us using the kinds of boosters that are available to us through the New Frontiers program, and specifically the Atlas boosters. Uh, and so uh, getting the energy to go out to the Mars and back with a spacecraft was going to be um, a, a pretty sporty uh, proposition. And instead, what we chose to do is find asteroids that come to us, and those are the near-Earth asteroids. And at that time, we had about 8,000 of those in our, in our inventory of objects. So uh, we chose to start looking more closely at that list. Uh, when we started looking at the uh, near-Earth asteroids, uh, we found that only about 350 of those had orbital parameters that were satisfactory uh, to meet the, the time frames uh, for mounting a mission and then getting back in time. So we really wanted a set of orbits that were ideally pro uh, uh, positioned for our mission uh, so that we could fly it starting in, in, uh, in 2016 and uh, have the mission back by 2023. Uh, if we look at those 350, only about 29 of them had diameters that were over 200 meters. And there's a couple of reasons why we want to select a larger asteroid from the group. First of all, small asteroids tend to spin fairly fast, and we didn't want anything that was likely to throw off all of the loose material that we would actually be looking for in order to obtain a sample when we were around Bennu. Uh, so we chose larger objects that had lower rotation rates. Uh, furthermore, uh, Dealing a, a, with the microgravity of asteroids actually represents a, a significant technological, technological challenge to our mission. And um, I'm not sure I'll have a whole lot of time to talk about that. Perhaps we could talk about it during the Q&A. 
but we really preferred to have uh, objects that were a little larger. It allowed us to do orbits and so forth around the asteroid. Uh, so, uh, so we had 29 objects then to choose from. Of those, only five were carbonaceous, and we had already we've already talked about why a carbonaceous asteroid uh, represents uh, an ideal object for our study, and uh, and it turned out that um, that Bennu was really the ideal object. And the thing that really nailed that for us was the fact that just before we started looking for the ideal asteroid, uh, Bennu had actually been a radar target for both Arecibo and Goldstone. And I believe it was uh, 20, 2008. And uh, that's ideal because radar really helps you in a lot of ways. Uh, first of all, it gives you very precise positions for the asteroid. Uh, with radar, we're able to get the uh, asteroid position to about plus or minus 10 kilometers. And that means that we can reliably target the asteroid. Uh, we don't have to do a lot of uh, uh, in situ studies as we approach the asteroid to refine our, our approach. Uh, obviously, there'll be a lot of refinement that's necessary, but knowing where it's at within 10 kilometers makes things a lot easier. Uh, furthermore, with radar, you actually get a shape for the object, and that's really important. Uh, for any of you who happen to see the object uh, 67P, uh, which was the um, uh, target for the Rosetta mission, uh, that was a pretty gnarly looking uh, comet. And uh, trying to find a reasonable place to sample from it would have been difficult and also represented a, a, a fairly severe uh, operational challenge, as anybody from the Rosetta mission would be happy to tell you. Uh, so we have, uh, with Bennu, a nearly spherical object, about 500 meters in diameter. Uh, that simplifies our operations. It's a slightly squat shape, kind of a lemon drop shape with an equatorial bulge, but uh, overall it appears that it's a smooth surface. Uh, using the interplanetary radar at Arecibo, we can only see one discernible feature on the surface that's on the order of uh, 15 meters across, somewhere between 7 and 15 meters across, and so uh, that's, uh, that's really good. In addition, the radar uh, observations using a technique of circular polarization by polarizing the, the radar burst and then watching how it gets affected as it gets returned to the, uh, to the, uh, re the, the transmitting dish uh, actually gives you some insights about what the surface material is like. Uh, so uh, we actually have some indication from the radar observations that there probably is a fair bit of regolith on the surface of the asteroid. Uh, in addition, uh, we uh, have also done observations with the Spitzer Space Telescope and measured what's called thermal inertia. And thermal inertia is simply a measure of how fast or, or slowly an object heats up and cools down. And uh, loose material tends to heat up and cool down fairly rapidly, and our observations with the Spitzer Space Telescope indicate that, uh, that we see objects with relatively uh, low thermal inertia, and that indicates the present, uh, presence of loose material. So that's good, good too. And then finally, we've been able to study Bennu with ground-based telescopes. And looking at the light curves, it suggests that there's no satellites in orbit around Bennu. And that sim simply was great news because we don't want to have the operational complexity of having to dodge uh, satellites while we're trying to, to map the, uh, the asteroid. So let's talk a little bit about some of the instruments that are on board. And I, I think this is kind of uh, so, uh, an important topic because I've said to a lot of folks, if we ever have to fly a mission to an asteroid that we know is dangerous, we'll probably fly instruments that are very similar to the ones that we have on OSIRIS-REx. Uh, we have a, a, an optical camera suite uh, that was built here at the University of Arizona called OCAMS. That's the OSIRIS-REx camera suite. And it really consists of three independent cameras. At the top is Polycam, and it's an 8-inch rich accretion telescope, uh, which basically acquires the asteroid very early during approach, and also can be refocused to act as kind of a microscope uh, during our uh, low-altitude reconnaissance passes, and allows us to resolve material on the surface of Bennu less than 2 centimeters across. So that allows us to map that sample site during our reconnaissance uh, passes to really make sure that not only there is no hazardous material around the sample site, but there's also material for sampling. The SAM cam, uh, which is at about 3 o'clock in your slide there, it actually is a specialized camera that images the sampling event. So it's got a range of focus that is ideally set up to uh, uh, witness our sample event. In addition, it has a filter wheel with three clear filters. So in the event that we have to attempt 
the sampling more than once, we can change that filter in the event that the previous sampling attempt might have covered the camera with some dust. So uh, we, we get that opportunity without having to cloud our optics. At the bottom is our camera control module, which controls all three cameras. So not, uh, the uh, cameras can only operate one at a time, and the camera control module will switch from one camera to the other. All three cameras share the identical focal plane. So they have the same CCDs. They're 1024 by 1024 uh, CCD cameras. And then on the left is MapCam, uh, which is a smaller uh, uh, camera, but it has a color filter wheel. So this allows us to uh, perform color imagery as well as do broadband spectrophotometry uh, of the asteroid. So we're looking for things like space weathering uh, and also attempting to understand better the reflectivity of the asteroid uh, using some of our uh, the reflectivity of the asteroid uh, for the LIDARs that we'll be using for our investigations of the surface as well as for our guidance and navigation down to the surface. So that's our camera suite. The Goddard Space Flight Center uh, built OVIRS, which are, is our visible and near-infrared spectrometer. So this is a fairly standard sort of spectrometer you want to put on a mission like this because this is how we look for the various chemical and mineral species that we think are going to be important uh, to understand, uh, particularly organics and water. So uh, OVIRS maps the chemical abundances around uh, the asteroid. This is a spot spectrometer, so uh, it actually takes a spectrum every four seconds. Uh, so when you turn it on, it just starts producing spectra every four seconds, and we send back uh, literally thousands and thousands of spectral spots of the asteroid during our global and site-specific mapping. Uh, the image up on the upper right-hand corner is actually uh, our team, our OVIRS team, after they were successfully mounting the, um, uh, the um, uh, spectrometer on OSIRIS-REx, uh, which is just in the right-hand side of the picture. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'll show you pictures from the, remain the, of the remaining instruments that all show the instruments getting mounted on the spacecraft or the flight models that, uh, as they get ready to go on the spacecraft. Uh, we also have OTIS, uh, which is our thermal emission spectrometer. So this kind of complements OVIRS. OVIRS uh, sees Bennu from about 0.4 to about 4 microns. OTIS sees Bennu from about uh, point, or 2 to out to 100 microns. So we have nice overlap from 0.4 all the way out to 100 microns. Uh, by the time you're out to 100 microns, you're really well into the thermal infrared. Uh, in the shorter wavelengths that are visible from OTIS, you can also get some important mineral and chemical species that we're very interested in, particularly some large molecules. Uh, and this is a cool spectrometer. It's actually flown before, this design has flown before on some landed Mars missions as well as missions that are flying around Mars now from the, uh, on, on one of the orbiting missions. So this was built by the Arizona State University, Phil Christensen's team, absolutely the experts for how you build these things. Uh, this will help us also assess the composition of the surface. I mentioned before, understanding thermal inertia around an asteroid is a really important technique for finding that sampleable material, that loose regolith that we're looking for. So it can identify and tell you the difference between a hard rock surface or a surface that's covered with loose material. Uh, so effectively, we'll be taking Bennu's temperature with OTIS as well as looking for some of those other chemical and mineral species that we're interested in. Uh, we also have a contributed instrument from the Canadian Space Agency called OLA, and that is the OCAM's LIDAR altimeter. So this is effectively a radar style system that uses lasers instead. And this is actually one of the most sophisticated LIDARs that's ever flown. Uh, unlike previous LIDARs that have flown on missions around Mars and Mercury, this is a scanning LIDAR. So uh, uh, the previous missions that have flown have been spot LIDARs. So they take individual spots, return them, and so you effectively get a track across the surface of your object. This actually has a scanning mirror. So it allows you to scan across as you move along the asteroid and build up a picture. And, but the picture you're building up is a topographic map of the asteroid. Uh, and furthermore, it's a dual laser system. So we actually have a high power laser and a low power laser, and that gives us the ability to develop topographic information from as far away as seven kilometers and as close as 525 meters to the asteroid. And topographic maps are absolutely essential to the, uh, the, um, the successful operation of our mission. Uh, not only because we want to basically map our other 
information like spectral data on a topographic, a three-dimensional topographic map, kind of like you see on the right-hand side of your image or of your, of your screen right now. We want all of our scientific interpretation to be based on these three-dimensional rotatable maps of Bennu. But furthermore, we're going to use these topographic maps for navigating around the asteroid. I mentioned before that we have a, um, a low gravity environment. Uh, our, our spacecraft feels about half of the forces that are on it as gravity from the asteroid. The other half of the forces that affect our spacecraft is solar radiation pressure. And that solar radiation pressure is very difficult to model entirely well. And the effect of that is that it can actually change the orbit of the, uh, of, of the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft in such a way that if we didn't pay attention to where we were at, after a few days, we wouldn't know which direction to point the spacecraft to take an image of Bennu. And so we have to take frequent optical navigation images and then compare those with the topographic maps that we generate with OLA in order to be able to tell where we're at. So we'll be doing that about every two hours. We'll be taking an optical navigation image and using that to figure out where we're at. And I tell people, it's kind of like when you fly in to your hometown and you've been over it many, many times and you start looking out the window and you go like, oh, well, you know, there's the baseball stadium and there's the downtown. I know where I'm at. Uh, that's the same sort of technique that we'll use when we're developing our optical navigation techniques around, uh, around the asteroid. And we'll be relying on OLA as well as other sources of topographic information in order to build those maps up uh, so our team can navigate us uh, successfully around Bennu. Another instrument that we have on board that we're very excited about is something called REXUS. And this is a, um, uh, an X-ray spectrometer uh, that will actually look for elemental abundances. So simple elements uh, 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 like cobalt and iron and other elements actually fluoresce in X-rays. And the source of those X-rays that cause that fluorescence is the sun. And so we can actually put an X-ray sensitive instrument on board the spacecraft and monitor the solar X-ray output at the same time that we're looking at the re-emitted X-rays from the surface of Bennu and map out the existence of individual element, elemental species on the surface. The thing that makes this extremely exciting is this is an instrument that's built by students. Uh, we held a competition uh, with an independent funding from NASA headquarters for a sophisticated instrument that would fly on board this uh, spacecraft and return important scientific information. That, uh, that competition was won by students at MIT, and this instrument has been designed, built, and will be operated by those students uh, as we fly around the asteroid. Very exciting and a really, really cool experiment. And, and, and in every way, these students have really performed outstandingly, uh, not only in the technical aspects of building this instrument, but in the programmatic aspects of showing up at the program reviews and demonstrating to us that they're building an instrument that's going to actually be able to get the job done. So uh, kudos to the folks at MIT. Uh, in addition, we'll have several other instruments on board the spacecraft that we'll use for navigation, guidance, and, uh, and also to uh, monitor sample stowage. We'll have some special cameras that will be doing the optical navigation imagery that I talked to you about. Uh, we'll also have some special LIDARs. They're called GNNC, or Guidance Navigation and Control LIDARs, that will actually provide ranging information uh, to the spacecraft as it makes its descent to the surface to, uh, to take that sample. Uh, we'll also have an additional special camera that will confirm the stowage of the head that will obtain the sample in the sample return capsule. I'll talk about that in the next slide. But we've got to have a special camera that we know we can look at and say, yep, we've got that, uh, that sample head stowed successfully. We can go ahead and shut the sample return capsule and wait for our opportunity to head home. Uh, finally, we'll also be using the telecommunication system on board our spacecraft uh, as a sensitive measure of, uh, of the velocity of the spacecraft around Bennu. And as we measure the, the changes in velocity, the subtle changes in velocity around Bennu, that's an indication of gravitational or, or, or gravitational masses in, or, uh, in, the, in the asteroid. And we can map those out so we can determine whether Bennu is actually a monolithic body or whether it's a large rubble pile loosely held together by gravity. So over the course of our thousand days at the asteroid, we'll be actually mapping out the internal structure of the asteroid using uh, uh, Doppler measurements from the telecommunications system on board the spacecraft. 
So how are we going to get the sample? Uh, we're actually uh, doing a very simple technique uh, using something we call touch and go. Uh, trying to actually land on an asteroid is a really hard proposition. We, because of the microgravity, we have to find some way to anchor ourselves when we tried to land because uh, even the smallest motion or the smallest miscalculation in the approach velocity could cause our spacecraft to bounce right off Bennu. In fact, that's what happened with the Philae lander on the Rosetta mission. Uh, it bounced almost two kilometers uh, when it hurt, hit the surface of 67 feet. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to approach the surface of Bennu very slowly, about 10 centimeters a second, uh, with, uh, after extending this long arm that you see uh, below our spacecraft in the lower left-hand corner of the, of the images. And at the end of that arm is a, about a 30 centimeter, uh, what we call tag head, touch and go head, and frankly, I tell people it looked like an air filter off of uh, my 67 Pontiac Firebird that I had when I was a kid. But the difference is, is that what we're going to do is when we make contact with the surface, we're going to inject a high pressure flow of nitrogen to the inside of the, uh, of the tag head. And you can see a schematic cutaway diagram at the upper right hand corner there. And that's going to fluidize the regolith underneath the tag head and attempt to push that out through the sides of the filter. Uh, but the filter will capture that material uh, and, uh, and let the nitrogen gas escape, but capture that, that entrained material that gets picked up when we inject that nitrogen. This whole process will only last about five seconds. Uh, so we will sense our contact with the surface, we'll fire off the nitrogen, we'll capture that material, and then we'll jet away from the surface. So we, uh, we stay, stay away from harm. Uh, in fact, you can see in the lower right-hand corner the actual flight model of our tag head as it's being prepared on the spacecraft. Uh, so uh, it's already stowed away and ready to go, and uh, we're, um, we're excited about that. You can see the, about, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, right here you can see the three bottles of nitrogen. We can attempt tag three times, uh, and each one of those bottles contain a 3,000 PSI charge of nitrogen that we'll use to uh, inject into the tag head. Uh, we've actually tested this technique on microgravity flights, and instead of the 60 grams that we would want to get, uh, we've yielded nearly two kilograms of material co uh, uh, collected. So if we're lucky to find an area with ample regolith, we have every hope that we'll bring back a, a lot of material from Bennu. So this is what our mission timeline looks like, and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that because I have a, 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 a video I wanna show you. But we launch uh, at, uh, in September 8th, which is just 49 days from now. We have about 712 days of outbound crews to get to Bennu. Uh, then about, um, about three months before we actually arrive begins our approach phase. And that's when we begin taking images of Bennu. We start getting in, uh, information about the spectral properties from a distance. Uh, and as we arrive at Bennu, we'll go into a, uh, an initial survey at seven kilometers away. We call that preliminary survey. And that'll take us about 20 days. After that time, we'll go into orbit around Bennu, and we're going to go into an orbit of around one and a half kilometers, and we'll spend probably something on the order of 70 days in that orbit. That's where we're really going to get our experience doing this navigation technique I was talking about earlier, uh, the optical navigation. We're going to be very convinced that we know how to do our optical navigation while we're in orbit A before we attempt anything more uh, sophisticated uh, in our proximity operations. From that time on, we'll start our detailed survey, which is a 63-day set of hyperbolic passes around the asteroid at three and a half and five kilometers. Uh, detailed survey is really where we get our global information about the asteroid, and it's after detailed survey that we'll make our initial down select from the global images to 12 sites, up to 12 sites, where we might want to sample. Uh, we will study those 12 sites during a period called orbit B, and that's a one-kilometer orbit around the asteroid. Uh, after orbit B, we will be able to winnow our choice down to two sites, a primary and a secondary site, and then we'll begin a series of reconnaissance steps where we'll fly over each one of those sites at 525 and 250 kilometers, or 225 meters, rather, and, and, and uh, 525 meters, so that's really close, to get those very high-resolution images of the surface. Uh, at that point, we can then begin, uh, then we can make our final choice about where our sample site is at, and then we'd be in a, a series of rehearsals. And we're going to set aside a, about 225 days for rehearsal. We really want to get this right. We expect things won't go right the first time around. 
And so we want to make sure that we feel very confident that when we actually attempt to tag, we're going to get it, we're going to get it the first time. Uh, at that point, around July of 2020, we expect to attempt our sample collection. Uh, at that point, we, uh, we will tuck the sample away uh, and wait uh, until our opportunity for departure, which begins March 3rd of 2021. That begins a return cruise of 934 days, uh, which gets us back to Earth uh, nominally in September of 2023. So that's, uh, that's what our mission overall looks like. And with a few minutes I have left, I'll show you a quick movie. And it'll just take me a second to get that done. So stand by. No, that's not going to work. Stand by. There we go. So if everybody can see that, uh, we, uh, we begin our, our flight actually on September 8th now. This video is a little outdated on a Atlas 411. Uh, and we will head out uh, directly to Bennu, so we won't orbit the Earth. We'll just begin our trajectory uh, flying uh, down south towards Australia. And as soon as we come in, uh, contact with the Canberra DSN station, we'll separate the OSIRIS-REx uh, spacecraft and begin our, uh, our lonely long journey out to Bennu. Now, that's about two years, and uh, about one year out, we'll come back by the Earth to do an Earth gravity assist. Uh, the reason we'll do that is because we need to actually change the plane of orbit of our spacecraft about six degrees, and that's where we really get a nice boost from the Earth's gravity. Uh, I mentioned the approach phase. We'll begin that about 90 days out from Bennu. One of the first things that we'll do is begin to survey around to see if we can find any objects orbiting Bennu. Uh, we can actually find objects down to about 10 centimeters in size. Anything that might represent a hazard to our spacecraft would cause us to stop and reconsider how we're going to approach uh, our observations of this uh, space or of, of Bennu. Uh, providing that we don't have any problems, we'll approach more closely and begin our process of preliminary survey. Uh, preliminary survey uh, really involves three passes over Bennu at seven kilometers. And these are hyperbolic passes. We're not in orbit. That means that if there, something goes wrong, the spacecraft will just fly on by harmlessly with no concerns for uh, uh, an impact with Bennu. Uh, we'll be making uh, camera observations as well as LIDAR observations to begin building up our first topographic maps of the surface. From that point on, we'll go into that orbit phase A, and this is the time where we really work out the details of how we navigate around the asteroid, we, uh, we develop our techniques, we make sure we're comfortable because we then begin detailed survey. And we begin a series of three and a half kilometer passes in something we call the baseball diamond, where we observe Bennu from four different geometries to build up stereographic images of the surface from three and a half kilometers. We then do a series of hyperbolic passes at five kilometers so we can take our spectral data. And this is where we get our global spectral information of Bennu, and we get that from seven different geometries, seven different relationships to how Bennu is illuminated by the sun. So this takes about seven weeks, it's one week per pass, and we do that from uh, the equatorial position, uh, but the relationship of the spacecraft and Bennu and the sun is different each time. After that, then we, we can uh, do our down select to up to 12 sites, and we go into orbital B, uh, where we begin our direct observations of each one of those sites to start winnowing our decisions down to just two. Uh, I mentioned before that solar radiation pressure is something the spacecraft feels, and you can see that in the Terminator orbit that, uh, the Terminator orbit that we fly, the uh, orbit actually moves around, and that's caused by the solar radiation pressure that the spacecraft feels while it's in orbit. And uh, so you can see that uh, as we do this, we will build up uh, direct observations of these individual sites. Then we begin a series of reconnaissance passes, uh, 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 one each at least of 225 meters of the surface in order to obtain the high resolution imaging to convince ourselves that there's ample regolith on the surface of the asteroid. Uh, then we'll also do some 525 meter passes to get another look at the sites with our spectrometers. So this really is our, our high context information about the surface 
of the uh, asteroid at the sites that we're actually going to sample at. Once we've selected a site, we begin a series of rehearsals where we leave our one kilometer orbit. Uh, first, we go to something called checkpoint. This is the point at which we would make a burn uh, to move down to the surface of the spacecraft or to the surface of the asteroid. Uh, once we've successfully done that, we'll go a little further to something we call match point, which is where we will actually match our rotation rate of the spacecraft and the asteroid for our final approach to the surface. Uh, if everything goes well, we're going to go, go after the actual sample collection event. The spacecraft will uh, extend its tag SAM arm. As you see here, this arm is about uh, six meters long, and uh, it has that uh, little filter mechanism at the end that I described earlier. We approach the surface of Bennu at about 10 centimeters per second. This whole process takes about four and a half hours, and we're entirely on automatic here. The spacecraft is actually controlling its descent and monitoring its position on its own as it uh, descends towards uh, the surface of Bennu. Uh, once we hit the surface of Bennu, uh, well, I shouldn't say to use, use the word hit, once we touch the surface of Bennu, uh, we, uh, we deploy the gas. You can see a, a, a graphic here from our microgravity flights of how, what that looks like and a schematic of how that process works. So after we've uh, touched Bennu, we've got several sensors which tell us that we've made that and uh, that we made the touch. We'll jet away and we'll begin uh, trying to understand whether we, we obtained a, a sample. Uh, one of the ways that we do this is we'll rotate the spacecraft with the sample arm extended and measure the change in angular momentum of the spacecraft to actually weigh the sample. We'll compare this with the same technique that we did when we had an empty sample head and we'll be able to confirm whether we have a sample. Uh, once we've actually confirmed that we've got a sample, We'll put the sample head in the eye of uh, one of our cameras. We'll examine the base plate of the sample head where we have a set of contact plates. They're effectively stainless steel Velcro that can pick up uh, the surface uh, uh, samples of the asteroid. And we'll examine those to see whether we've got a good sample there and to make sure that nothing's sticking out that would interfere with our ability to stow the sample head. If everything looks good, then we're going to open the sample return capsule uh, lid We'll place the tag head on the inside and an explosive bolt will be fired, leaving the tag head uh, in the uh, in this, uh, sample return capsule. It'll be closed and then we wait patiently until our first opportunity to leave Bennu in 2021 and begin a two year cruise back to the Earth. Uh, once we're about four hours out from the Earth, uh, the spacecraft will release uh, the sample head and, uh, and then jet the spacecraft away from the Earth. Uh, so that'll go into an interior orbit around the Sun, leaving only the sample return capsule uh, to return to the Earth. Uh, the sample return capsule is based on the same technology that was used to uh, bring back the Stardust samples. And uh, so uh, we've actually got an image of the Stardust uh, uh, sample coming home here in just a second. There we go. And so that's Stardust coming home to the Utah Test and Training Range just outside of Salt Lake City. That's also the place where we will uh, land our capsule, where it will be recovered, and then um, uh, the, uh, uh, the capsule will be picked up by a trained team. It will be rapidly stowed carefully to avoid any contamination, and it will be turned to the Johnson Space Flight Center where uh, it will be opened up, and hopefully it will be packed with precious samples of uh, asteroid Bennu. So let's see, I think I've got just uh, one more PowerPoint, it might be it. And uh, let's see, we will switch our screens the cam now i'm having problems switching my screens so i'll just do this so the status of our spacecraft we're at kennedy space center we are completing up all of our final testing uh, we are just getting ready to put the spacecraft encapsulate it in the fairing uh, it will go on top of the uh, rocket uh, at the end of august and uh, so we're all very excited uh, things are going very well the spacecraft's in great shape, no problems. 
Uh, so knock on wood, we're going to have a very successful launch on September 8th. Uh, finally, I'd, I'd encourage everybody to uh, visit our website at asteroidmission.org. Uh, we've got a lot of animations there. We have a lot of uh, interpretive materials. We have some public outreach materials, which can be downloaded there as well. We have some great videos on our own YouTube channel uh, at uh, youtube.com slash Osiris Rex. And of course, we have uh, a Twitter and Facebook presence as well. So with that, I'll say thank you. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll be glad to, uh, to, to field those if I can. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ed. That's uh, it's really interesting. It's uh, you know, it, it's quite a complex mission when you really think about it. Uh, it really we is. do have a few uh, what looks like some really good questions here. Um, during the talk, we also had a couple of people who raised their hands. Um, and one of the ways that this works is that if you have questions, please uh, find the Q and A window at the bottom of your screen and type your questions in there so that we can see them. So unfortunately, we don't have the ability to uh, uh, have people ask questions uh, over audio. So let's get to a couple of questions here. Um, this was uh, the first one, and actually it's kind of interesting. How and when was the asteroid name Bennu decided, and what does it mean? It's kind of a historical thing. And Right. Well, Osiris-Rex, of course, has a, you know, it, it doesn't have anything to do with Egyptian history, but it turns out that the acronym for Osiris-Rex uh, implies a certain Egyptian kind of character. And so we thought, we thought it would be a good idea to name our object, because at the time it was known as 10199 RQ-36, 1999 RQ-36, not a particularly easy thing to remember itself. So we, we had a naming contest with, uh, uh, that was uh, sponsored by the Planetary Society. And uh, we uh, went out to school kids around the world and we had over 8,000 uh, suggestions for names and we proposed uh, myth mythological names. And it turns out Bennu is the name of the heron uh, that was uh, a, a companion to Osiris. And uh, we thought uh, our spacecraft, or at least the student that uh, named it, uh, thought our spacecraft looked a bit like a heron with a long neck, uh, the tag sam arm at the end. And so it seemed to fit really well. It was something that was easy to remember and easy to spell, and it, uh, it, it stuck very quickly. So that's how we named it then. Okay. So we have uh, another, just a quick question. I'll actually answer this one. Darian asked, is the mission animation video available online? Indeed uh, it is. Yeah, it is. Onto our, uh, onto our uh, YouTube video channel. And so when you go to find, uh, actually, there's a link to it mm -hmm. on uh, the uh, outreach resource page on the Next Sky Network page. It's very large. It's 400 megabytes. And so we had a, a little bit of a challenge uh, uh, getting it uh, so that people could actually watch it. But yes, you can uh, find it on the NSN website. And you can also get it uh, from the uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I believe it's the, um, um, well, they have an animations page there. You, if, you, if you just Google Goddard Space Flight Center and OSIRIS-REx, I think you're going to get uh, pointed uh, to a conceptual image lab is what it's called. And they have a variety of versions of the animations that are available all the way from 4K down to something a little bit more uh, palatable. And also, uh, just before launch, we'll be releasing a new set of mission animations, higher resolution, 5K imagery, as well as uh, a much uh, higher um, fidelity animations of the entire mission. So keep an eye out for those as well. Great. Okay, we have uh, a viewer uh, um, ask this question. Uh, is OSIRIS-REx going to be running off of solar energy like Juno? And if so, is that the main source of power that most missions are making use of currently? Uh, that's correct. Uh, we have solar panels on board the spacecraft, and fortunately, because Bennu actually orbits fairly close to the Earth, uh, we have ample supplies of solar energy. Uh, as I mentioned before, Bennu is a near-Earth object, so its orbit runs anywhere from about 0.9 to about 1.2 astronomical units from the Sun, so there's lots of solar energy there. And uh, yeah, most, uh, most of the uh, uh, missions that we're flying today do use solar panels. There's a, there's a um, uh, a lot of impetus to do that uh, simply because of the availability of uh, the special form of plutonium that's used to power radioisothermic uh, reactors is not readily available, although NASA is in the process of, of uh, making more of that uh, in conjunction with the Department of Energy. But uh, there's obviously uh, uh, issues associated with flying radiothermal generators as well, 
So uh, when, when solar panels can be flown, that's generally preferred. Okay, great. Chris asks, and this is a, another uh, you know, energy question, mm -hmm. what if orbit changes? Mm -hmm. How much fuel is available? Should extra maneuvering be needed around the asteroid? Good question, actually. Uh, so uh, our spacecraft is about 950 kilograms dry. And when we, uh, when we load it up with hydrazine, which is the fuel that we use for maneuvering, uh, it'll be just a little over 2,000 kilograms total. Uh, so we've got just about uh, 1,200 kilograms of uh, fuel on board. That turns out to be plenty, uh, particularly for uh, uh, maneuvers around the asteroid. Mentioned before that we're flying in a microgravity environment. The gravity from Bennu is so small that the, uh, the impetus that we, the, the change in velocity, the delta V as it's called, is actually measured in millimeters per second that we need from our rocket engines to begin our descent to the surface. So all of our maneuvers around the asteroid take almost a trivial amount of hydrazine. It's really getting to the asteroid and then returning back where we'll use most of our fuel. Okay, and this is kind of related to this maneuvering question too. Stuart asks, are there any plans to use the probe after the sample reaches Earth for other possible missions as was done with deep impact? Well, to my knowledge, uh, nobody's really taken a solid look at what opportunities might exist because we've been very focused on, uh, on our primary goals for our mission. Uh, one of the things that we do know is that the current plan is to uh, divert the, the bus, as we call it, away from the Earth, and that will take it into an interior orbit to the Earth. That means it's going to get hot uh, or hotter than it will normally get. And the spacecraft really wasn't configured and designed to operate in a high thermal stress environment. So uh, we have some concerns about whether the longevity of the bus will be, uh, will be available or whether the bus would be available for any alternative missions. That being said, we have some very clever people at NASA who help us try to figure out what we can do in terms of extended missions. And I wouldn't be surprised if somebody comes up with something which, uh, which might allow us to get some additional scientific utility out of the spacecraft. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Jim actually asked a very similar question. I think that, that uh, we could have combined these. He said, uh, what happens to OSIRIS-REx after the return capsule is deployed back to Earth? And so it sounds like you uh, uh, addressed that fairly okay. well. Thank you. Um, here's another uh, uh, instrument question. We've got time for a couple more, then we have a, a little bit of business to take care of the end. Darian asks, uh, why was the Ritchie Crutchian optical assembly utilized versus some of the other types that they could have used? Well, that's a good question, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not, uh, I'm not really familiar with why the choice, although, uh, you know, Ritchie Crescent Optics uh, can correct the image very well. So, uh, you, know, it, you know, certainly, you know, with uh, ground-based telescopes, in my own experience, uh, uh, RC optics are, are really preferred uh, because they produce a very nice flat field across a wide field of view. So my guess is that that's probably the original reason why that was chosen. Uh, also, it's a sealed optical system. That particular configuration was easy to seal against contamination. So that probably was another reason why that choice was made early on. Okay. And I particularly like this question because I thought of this earlier too. Stuart asks, when you hit the surface of Bennu with the high pressure nitrogen gas to obtain the sample, what keeps the nitrogen gas from acting like a thruster to push the probe away from the asteroid? Yeah, we, so we looked at that, and uh, it's really the inertia of the spacecraft. So that's why we have a, the spacecraft's moving down at around 10 centimeters per second. Uh, we actually did look at uh, a, a variant of that problem, which is could the spacecraft be turned into an air puck? Uh, so, that, that, so we actually could slip on, we call it slipping on the banana peel. And uh, we've done a lot of the uh, mechanical analyses, and we're, we've concluded that as long as the uh, nitrogen fires off at the right time, that's really not going to represent a problem. But uh, believe me, we did look carefully at that. Okay. And the last question that we have, this is, uh, has to do with our commercial applications. David in Seattle asks uh, that there's a, a lot of millionaires who are backing planetary resources and he was right. wondering if there's any commercial ventures that are going to consider using the OSIRIS-REx protocols. Uh, we've, certainly, we've certainly talked to some of the folks who are interested in uh, exploiting the economics of asteroids. I think it's a little too early to look at that specifically, but uh, you know, we certainly believe that some of the techniques that we're developing, not only with the instruments and the observations, but the navigation techniques of, uh, of flying around an asteroid, orbiting around an asteroid, or something that are gonna be of tall 
interest to anybody who would be interested in, in exploring the asteroids to mine them either for economically useful materials or to uh, use asteroids as filling stations. Uh, if we do find water on an asteroid, we can find we can pull the water from them, disassociate it with solar energy, and make hydrogen and oxygen. So we've got fuel uh, to explore the the outer solar system. So we believe that the techniques that we're developing here will be of interest. But uh, in order to, we have not had any specific arrangements other than to have conversations with them about it. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Ed. This is a you know, fascinating mission. I'm looking forward to getting back. I'm, you know, it, it's remarkable that you're, how much you're going to be able to learn with only 60 grams of material. It's remarkable what, uh, you know, what you're going to learn from that small amount of material. You bet. And in fact, uh, just uh, three quarters of that 60 grams will be archived for the future. So we only need 25 to actually meet all of our mission goals. Well, that's good. That's good. We won't all be destroyed. And yeah, that's right. Excellent. Well, that's all for tonight, everyone. You'll be able to find this telecon along with many others on the Next Sky Network under the Outreach Resources section. Just search for webinar. We'll also post tonight's presentation on the Next Sky Network YouTube page by the end of the week. You can also find other resources and activities, including the, the uh, video that Ed showed, on this webinar's dedicated resource page. And now for our